to highlight strong women on the coast. We have so many women who have started at the bottom of the ladder and have worked their way up. And today, and for this series, I am actually saluting the women, the strong women, and highlighting how they have started at the bottom and where they are now, and they are still growing. Um, today, I've got one of my youngest professional women who everybody on the coast will know. When you open your eyes in the morning, you will hear the most wonderful dulcet tones of this voice that makes you feel, ah, oh, the day has started. Even if it's gray outside, she brings a ray of sunshine into your life and into your day, whether you're in the kitchen, whether you're in the bathroom, or whether you slim bed. And this is the wonderful Hannah Murray of Talk Radio Europe. Hello, Hannah, and how are uh, you? Hello, Sandy. Thank you so much. What a lovely introduction. I'm very honoured to have been asked. Thank oh, you. You are so welcome. You are one of my youngest. And uh, the reason is that you, you started 18 years ago, to my knowledge. And in fact, I can recall exactly when I met you. Uh, it was at a hotel when you were working alongside a very good and close friend of mine, um, Mary Harbo, who was the queen of radio. Absolutely. And you now are, in my eyes, and I know in many, many of my viewers' eyes, the queen of radio on this coast. Oh. That's really lovely. I mean, I, I really did learn from the best, as you say, Mary Harbo, the queen of radio. She she was she she was amazing. She still is amazing. I'm, I'm still in touch with her. But uh, I learned an awful lot from her. Absolutely. Yeah. She and I used to do um, when she was with Ondefero, uh, she and I used to do a, a Monday program together. I used to be the showbiz person bringing in all the showbiz gossip. And we would have a lovely natural and whatever. But I've actually watched you and listened to you grow. And you've given us 18 years of your life. You've shared so much of your life with us, even to learning to drive and driving. <laughs> so, you know, you've come into our home, but you brought us into your home and your world as well. So it's a, a twofold. When... <laughs> So thank you. Uh, no problem. No, I was just going to comment on that. It's really funny because sometimes I forget that I've talked about my wedding or my driving or, or whatever. And, and I might meet someone who I who I don't really know, obviously not a not a friend or, or whatever. And they'll say, oh, how, hi, Hannah, how's the driving going? And I'll think, oh, have I spoken to you about driving? I, I wasn't aware that I, I don't, don't say that, but I think that and realise, of course, straight away, of course, I said on the radio. <laughs> you see, on the radio, you are so natural. You open up. You make us laugh. Um, you talk to interesting people. You give us news. There is so much information coming from you, not only from your Daybreak programme, but from your life. And just generally, and you do have another program as well, which we'll go into uh, later on in the program. But I want to ask you, um, how did you start off? Because you're still very young. When you left school, what did you think you were going to be doing? School, I was, I loved gymnastics. I was really into gymnastics. I was always a performer. Um, never kept still, was always on the move. And then I, I, I stopped gymnastics because you have to go into it, you know, from a really early age. And I, I stopped when I was about 11, I think. And, but still wanted to perform and loved acting, singing, dancing, prancing around basically. So thought I'd love to be on the stage or in TV, in film, anything like that. So that's what I did at college. I did a BTEC National Diploma in Performing Arts at Yeovil College in Somerset and absolutely loved it. It was brilliant. Really, really loved it. Okay, but you left that. And I think that you had what I had and still have got, the travel bug. And mm. it has taken you all over the world. Yes, it really has. I started when I was 17 I think basically went on holiday to Greece and was planning to stay just for, for three weeks and ended up staying for another three months 
and absolutely loved it. That was in Naxos in Greece. Yeah, Naxos very well. Naxos, really? Naxos in Paris I love. Oh, well, I spent three summers in Naxos. I didn't, the only reason I didn't live there full time was because the, the whole island basically shut down in September, October. I'd stay on as long as I could. Yeah. But then there were, there were no tourists, so there was no work, really. Um, so in between three seasons in Naxos, I went to Tenerife. I went to Dublin. I went to Amsterdam all the time doing various bar jobs, working in bars and, and restaurants and cafes and things like that. So always dealing with the public. And I always used to think I was never a particularly good waitress, as in I one, one plate in each hand. I couldn't have them up the arm or anything, but I was, I think I was good with people. So I used to chat to people. So I, I got good tips because I used to recommend where they should go on holiday and things like that. So I, I love doing that. And then ended up being the longest time I was away before coming to Spain was I did a year in Australia, followed by three months in New Zealand and then a month in Thailand. What were you doing in and Australia? Traveling, uh, backpacking. Really? And yeah. All your, in all your travels and your bar work, uh, I know that you act because uh, you're part of the acting group on the coast. Uh, do you sing as well? Yes. <laughs> so were you, in singing, choir. were you singing and acting in the various places where you were jumping from one country to another, from one place to another? No, no, actually, I, I never got involved with that because I wasn't in the same place long enough. Um, I, I only stayed in, in each place for a few months, roughly. And I was, yeah, I was backpacking. I was a tourist, if you like. So I was just seeing as much of the place as I could whilst working and, and trying to earn money and then move on to the next place. So it was only when I came to Spain that I was able to get back into acting and being on stage again, which has really been fantastic. And very much a love of your life that I know. Mm. And you're very much part of the acting scene along the coast here. Um, and then you have always been a reader as well from a young age. And this morning I heard your program that you were talking about some books that you only really found or enjoyed when you were much older than when you read it as a child. Yes, it's funny. I'm, I've always been a little bit embarrassed hosting the book show, feeling I'm, I'm not as much of a reader as people maybe expect me to be or assume I am. I think I've got away with um, quizzing. That's my, that's my reason, because I do uh, pub quizzes and have been hosting a quiz for over 10 years. I've learned so much about books and popular culture and things that I haven't necessarily read myself so I'm um, it was actually one of my things this year at the beginning of the year that I was determined to read a lot more this year and and I have I'm already on my fourth book uh at the beginning of March which is which is really good it's, for me it's, it's virtually one a month yeah yeah it's not more because we're only at the beginning and yeah. you're already onto your fourth um yeah but how did you get into quizzes? Where does that come about in your life? Definitely my mum and dad. I'm an only child and I was brought up, my mum and dad worked from home a lot of the time. So I was very, very lucky. I, I got to see them a lot growing up and I've always spent a lot of time with them and we're very close as a result. And family holidays would be, we did a lot of Euro camping. So staying in posh campsites, if you like, around Europe. So on a three week holiday, we might go to six or seven countries with mum and dad sharing the driving. And we'd spend a couple of nights in Northern France, then two nights in the middle of France, and then over to, to Switzerland and Austria. And, you know, we, we'd, we'd travel around. So spent a lot of time on the road. So we were always playing card ga and car games and my dad was, you know, we'd, we'd look at number plates and try and make words out of the last three letters of number plates or, or doing alliteration with the three letters. Um, and capital cities from a young age, my dad used to teach me the capital cities of the world. And uh, a funny story, when I was about nine, 
in um, in our class in school, the teacher said, OK, we're going to do a little quiz. Everybody needs to come up with a question to ask the rest of the class. And it can be whatever you're interested in. So the boys were doing questions about their local football team, the girls about Care Bears or My Little Pony or things like that. And my question was, what's the capital of Burkina Faso? And all the children <laughs> even have gone, what? <laughs> yes, that's exactly what happened. All the children started laughing because it sounded like a funny word. And the teacher was shaking her head saying, come on, Hannah, no, do a, do a proper question. And I said, well, it, it is a proper question, miss. She said, you can't just make up a country. And I said, I, I haven't made up a country. It's, it's a country in Africa, Burkina Faso. And all the children are laughing again. And she said, well, what's the capital then? And I said, Ouagadougou. <laughs> Of course, everybody is laughing and she thought I'd made it up. So I found an atlas and pointed it out to her and she was ever so embarrassed. <laughs> because I was born in Africa, but I've never ever heard that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, look it up. <laughs> Tell me, where is it near? Um, it's on the, I'm pretty sure it's on the east coast. Uh, no, sorry, west coast. It's on the west coast near um uh, um the gambia and gambia. that sort of side i think right. yeah okay well yeah. hannah murray you have certainly taught me something today <laughs> well, <that's nice. laughs> now um you had a program before you had daybreak what was it yes well actually my gosh i i had quite a few uh, well two three more um the first one i did was stage and screen which was perfect for me that was a, a show that went out on a sunday and i really loved that because it was obviously my love of, of of stage and screen so i used to play about with the themes i'd do um the the 100 greatest musicals of all time and each week i'd i'd be working through for the 100 and it would take me a few months to get down to one and i'd talk about the musical and the awards that it had won and then play a song from the show um, or, or I'd do an hour on Tom Hanks for example and talk about all the show, the films that he'd been in and play songs from the films things like that so I loved stage and screen and then the first live show I got was the Saturday morning breakfast show and I did that for I'm not sure how long maybe maybe a year or so and then got the afternoon magazine show, which was Mary Harbo's show and the show that I've been producing for her for years. She was writing books and she went on a sabbatical. So um, at the radio station, they were desperately looking for another woman, ideally, to take her place. And, and they, they couldn't find anyone. And someone at the station said, well, what about Hannah? And, and it was, oh, did, well, could, could Hannah do it? You know, interviewing people I'd never interviewed before. Very different skill to, to just talking on the radio. And uh, I was 27 at the time. And we all just kind of thought, well, go for it. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> and thankfully, I was, I was OK. I mean, I, I hope I've obviously got, got better since then and learned a lot. But I, as I say, having Mary Harbo as a fantastic teacher learned an awful lot from her so uh, I did the the afternoon magazine show for four five years before getting daybreak which I've now been doing for eight I think okay <laughs> I, I don't know if you've noticed I vaguely turned around and I don't know if you can see my background can you yes yes uh, when you see said stage and screen uh, I've been very involved in uh, films and uh, stage and music. And behind me are stage and screen photos and posters. And so you are hitting the very heart of my life and my love. And in fact, oh. uh, I was part of BAFTA for many, many, many years. Um, oh. And sadly, when people who had been there for many years uh, as judges of BAFTA films, uh, when we turned 70, BAFTA said to us, sorry guys, uh, you can stay as members, but you can't judge any of the films anymore. We want oh. you to come in, but should you leave us as members, you will never be able to re become members again. The door will be closed. And we all felt that was a little bit sad because 
it was part of our life. 195 Piccadilly was my second home. And November, December, January, um, three, four screenings a day. Just so, you know, absolutely perfect. So that is very much part of my life as well. So mm. um, you probably didn't know that. Um, no. You've interviewed a lot of people. Um, fun people, serious people, people that have surprised you. Are there any people that you would like to share with us that have been fun, that they will appreciate you remembering them in the way that you feel about them? Gosh, it's the million dollar question, isn't it? There's, there's been, I've been so fortunate. There've been so many people who have been amazing to chat to. It's, it's always a, a, a bit of a thrill, I guess, if you're speaking to a celebrity, somebody well known that maybe you've read their books or watched them on TV or film. It's, it's exciting, and that there haven't been that many disappointments in that field. There, there've been a few, which I won't tell you about. Don't know. But, <laughs> yeah but no most of the time they they're, they're great to speak to you know they're professionals they're used to being interviewed and, and they've always got great stories to tell it's always nice when you're speaking to somebody who has been interviewed thousands and thousands of times when they say something like well, that's a great question yeah. because you, you think that for them, they're kind of going through the motions. Yes, yes, they've got a new film out and it can be easy for them to feel a bit monotonous, same old questions, same old things. So it's nice if you can think of something different and, and get them really, you know, thinking outside the box and, and having a good conversation. And that that happens, as I say, fairly regularly. I don't know, but it, it, it's happened quite a few times, which is lovely. But it's also nice when you speak to people who, aren't famous, who aren't well known, who, who have an extraordinary story to tell, of which there are, are many. Uh, just the other day, my guest was a 70 year old man who had, um, he'd been rowing from across the Atlantic on his own solo in a, in a rowing boat. And he was just fabulous. He said, every day I thought of my wife, we've been married for over 50 years. I'd call her every morning and every evening and he just it was just lovely and really really humble and and it's speaking to people like that you think oh, I love my job I'm so lucky. <laughs> I think people like us are actually blessed to have had the privilege of finding the little gold nuggets from people's lives and you would have shared lots of those nuggets and we, we never I listen to you and I never know what you're going to come up with but I know it's either going to be fun interesting uh you've even taught me something today so you know <laughs> it's just your abundance of information uh when mm. you speak to your authors because you have the book show which is I think it's a coup because the uh, couple that did the book show on television uh, in England, who haven't done it for a long time, and we won't go into names, but you have achieved that on radio. And that's what I love about you, because you bring it to life without being seen. Uh, and you actually speak to the authors as well. How did that come about? I think the book show is is really interesting because a lot of people feel like they have a book in them. You know, people think they've got a story to tell, whether it's their own story or they just, you know, maybe they're avid readers and they think, yeah, I could do that. I'd love to write a book about the, something that they're passionate about or interested in. And yet the idea of writing a book and the process of writing the book is certainly not the same for everybody. And I constantly find it fascinating to be speaking to authors and asking them how they do it. And often they think that the way they do it is the same as everybody else. 
Uh, but it's really not just from the point of view of how some people plan so much and others really, I mean, even use the expression flying by the seat of their pants. They just kind of open up the laptop and start typing and, and see what comes out and they surprise themselves. They laugh at what they're writing. They cry at what they're writing and think, oh, this is good. This is going to work, which is really interesting. The book show was something that Mary Harbo did as part of her magazine show. And when I went on to do the magazine show, the book show was a part of that. And then it, it must have been going over to daybreak, the realization that the book show couldn't be part of the breakfast show. So it was going to be a separate show. So that's that's how that happened. And so you've got the book show, which comes out, which goes out, I should say, on a Wednesday, and then uh, there is a repeat on a Saturday. Wednesday, I think it's eight o'clock in the evening Spanish time. Uh, no, the other way around. So yeah. it's uh, Wednesday at seven o'clock in the evening Spanish time, repeated on Saturday at eight o'clock Spanish okay. time. Yeah. So I just mixed it up, but it's repeated <laughs> and it comes over twice. And have you spoken to any of the authors who, during our nearly a year lockdown time have actually just written a book within that time period yes yes absolutely recently a few people have i've or a few people that i've spoken to have um I, I interviewed a lady recently who'd written a book that was a love story set in lockdown and it was about two people who uh, were in the same apartment block I think but in different apartments and they kind of saw each other over a balcony and and waved and got talking online um and got to know each other really well without actually meeting and then their, their first date was when lockdown ended effectively and, and they were able to go out so I think it's inspired people to come up with different ideas I've I interviewed a chap recently for the book show that was more about the financial side of things and um, the kind of after effects of the pandemic and where we could be in 10 years time um, because of, of everything that ha has happened financially and people losing money and, and their jobs and their businesses and, and the implication of that, the possible implication of that. So it's really interesting. And obviously people have had more time as well. People always think I'd love to write a book, but I've got no time. And in this last year, people have had more time. So <laughs> I think a lot of people have thought, well, if I don't do it now, I might never do it. And it's easier to publish now as well, because you can publish via, away via Amazon. I, I don't really know how that works, but uh, I do know that people have done it that way. What about uh, you writing a book? Have you given that thought? I have, yes, consistently, almost and? every day when I interview a, an author, um, they inspire me and I, and I come away from the interview thinking, wow, you know, good for them. And then I get caught up in life and, and life goes on. I have, I did start writing a novel, gosh, 10 years ago, a very, very long time ago. And I, it's, it's always kind of there in my mind. And again, I think, oh, when I have more time, I'll do it. Of course, during lockdown, I was still working as normal. So it actually, I, I didn't necessarily have that much more time. And that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, Sorry, can, continue. No, I was just going to say, I did actually write a, a non-fiction book. I, not many people know this, to be oh. honest. Um, and I put a book together about seven or eight years ago called how to write no I, can't, I think I called it how to write a bestseller something like that and I had got in touch with different authors who I'd spoken to over the years who I'd got a good relationship with big names Lee, Lee Child, Jilly Cooper names that people will will know and asked them 10 you know asked if they were happy to be included in the book and and they were obviously and then asked them the same 10 questions that were things like how much planning do you do how important is research all that kind of thing and and got their answers which were all very different and that was sort of the point of the book to to emphasize that you know, for fans of Lee Child, they can see how he did it, but then realise that Jilly Cooper, also really successful, does it completely differently. She and does it just by typing 
still on an old typewriter, if my memory is correct, because I know her from yes. the <laughs> Yes, whereas Geoffrey Archer writes by hand. Still. He, he is still, yes. He likes the, he said he likes the feel of the pen in his hand and he writes his first draft by hand and then hands it over to his editor who types it up and they go from there. But yeah, and I mean, it didn't, it didn't get published. It didn't get accepted. I, I sent it to a few agents and they all kind of said it was a, a, a good idea, but oh, it's just, it's complicated. But but yeah, it didn't get anywhere, unfortunately. So I, I left it, which is a real shame. You know, when I started my TV career, um, one gentleman said to me, and something I've never forgotten, timing is all, okay? And maybe mm. now the time is right for you to publish it on Amazon and see the response you get. It's there, it's done. Come on, Hannah Murray, do something with it. Don't let it just lie there. Well, I just thought publishing on Amazon, I just thought with all these big, big names attached to it, I, I sort of thought it warranted a, a, a publisher and, and to do it properly, you know, so well, that was, that was kind of why. Who may pick you up by seeing it? And if you get somebody well known to write your forward, mm. um, just an idea. If and yeah. when you do it, please sign me a copy. <laughs> oh, bless you. Yes, I will. <laughs> Thank now, you. you've travelled, you've done uh, radio, you've been on the stage, you do quizzes. What have you got a passion for in the future? Because you're passionate about so many things in your life. What's your mm. passion? What are you going to achieve? What's your bucket list? Well, I mean, it's interesting, all the things that you said there, I kind of feel that they're all things that I want to do in my future, which is, which is really husband. nice. I mean, sorry? This time with your husband. Exactly, exactly. I mean, the, the traveling side of things, who knows when and how we can travel again? I mean, it's a big question for everybody. So my 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 husband and I sound like the queen we we have kind of made peace with maybe staying in Spain staying local at least for the near future there's there's so much we have to see on our doorstep we had an amazing honeymoon cruise three years ago now just over three years ago when and it was go? our first it was our first cruise we did the Caribbean oh where did you go did to the Caribbean we did a few nights in Miami yeah. And then we did uh, we did the Bahamas, Barbados, St. Kitts, uh, St. Lucia, all around there. And it was absolutely spectacular. It was a holiday of a lifetime. So we'd love to do more of that. When you were in Barbados, did you by any chance put your foot into the most wonderful hotel called Sandy Lane? <laughs> no we didn't we we wanted to we we talked about it we had a look at the lunch menu online and realized that we <laughs> it was not affordable <laughs> <laughs> we, we debated going to just have a glass of wine but we didn't in the end we found a, a lovely beach club and we were actually in Barbados on valentine's day i think oh, um yes we were away for valentine's day so we were there for valentine's so it was really nice we had a lovely lunch on the beach and it was barbados was actually the only place that we went to that we genuinely thought we'd love to go back there on holiday we could do like a two-week holiday there um loved it would definitely like to go back and when yeah. we do we'll go to sandy lane <laughs> go to sandy lane but do me a favor go into the ladies cloak room it has got the most magnificent floral displays that I've ever seen in any place in the world that I have traveled. And I don't know if you know, but I was a sailor. And so I sailed around the Caribbean for three months, mm -hmm. island hopping. And uh, Barbados was one of my favorite places. And uh, Sandy Lane, I mean, I still love it. Uh, I love Barbados. But all the places that you've mentioned, are favorites of mine. Uh, oh, I kept lovely. going back to St. Lucia. Mm. Uh, it was like my headquarters and just, it, it, it's special. So you and your husband, uh, PJ, I think you call yes. him. Yes, yes, his name's Paul, but he's known as PJ, yeah. Okay. 
Um, so you did your cruise, and what have you got planned for the future that you're going to do together of your bucket list? Well, we, I mean, it's, it's constantly expanding. We're always talking about places we want to go and see. We've, I've been to New York, but not with him. He's never been to New York. So that's definitely somewhere we would love to go together. Uh, he loves the stage as well. Since being with me, he's, he's come on stage and, and we've been in shows together, which has been really lovely. He's really enjoyed that. He's a natural. So we'd love to go to New York and go and see a show on Broadway and definitely do more cruises. We'd love to do an Asian cruise. I've been to Thailand, but he hasn't seen that part of the world. And I'd like to see more of it. I'd love to go to China and Japan, love Japanese food. So there's lots of, of parts of Asia that, that we'd love to see and have looked at cruising. And it just seems like a fabulous way of doing it, being able to stop at, at, at all the biggest, best places, Shanghai, Hong Kong, things like that, all in one trip just seems amazing. And he'd love to go to Australia as well. And Greece, he's never been to Greece and we love Greek food. Oh, Greece. So to go back to Greece again with him, yeah. I mean, yeah. Go, we go need... to Naxos and just exactly. enjoy Naxos exactly. and then go yeah. to Paris and Anti-Paris. Uh, yeah. Oh, absolutely <laughs> wonderful, wonderful places. I've got a girlfriend who um, spends three months of her, her year uh, and she is Naxos, Paris and... Uh, Luckily, she speaks Greek. She's not Greek, mm. uh, but she absolutely adores it. And uh, it, it's got it's got a vibe similar to ours, but with a different a different connotation. I don't know why. I don't know what it has. Um, mm. I think maybe it's the dancing. Maybe it's the dancing um, that they dance on tables. And things like that, which yeah. I haven't seen here, and I've lived here a long time, and I've partied a long time here as well, but <laughs> haven't seen that. So I'm putting that into that category. And yeah. um, do you have any other um, programs that you are thinking of perhaps making for radio? No, I don't. I don't think so. I. Uh... I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm happy happy doing the breakfast show and really enjoy doing the book show, as I said. So, no, I I don't think so. I mean, I loved stage and screen. I really did. But who knows if there'll be any kind of shake up with the with the station in in the near future or the far future, and we'll all kind of move around a bit and do different shows. I don't know. But no, I'm. I'm happy where I am at the moment. <laughs> and you're keeping us all alive. And as I said in the beginning, you are, we're waking up to your dulcet tones of happiness and joyous. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just, it makes the day. Um, and I haven't met many people that actually, yeah, in the UK, yes, but not down here, that you can feel the smile whether you feel it or not inside you, whether you've had a bad night or whatever, it never comes across. And you are the ultimate professional. Oh, and thank you. That's really nice. That's really, really so, nice. So, I do so think good. about it. I, I do feel like I'm a, a positive person. I was going to say I try to be positive. I, I don't think I do try. I, I, I think I'm just positive naturally. Um, and yeah, really, really try to put that across on the radio. I'm really conscious of not playing. I hardly ever play slow songs. It's one of my things in the morning. I, I think I personally want to be kind of woken up in the morning if I'm listening to the radio. I want music that makes me happy and, and, and you know, gets me ready for the day. So I'm really conscious of, of virtually every song I play from throughout the decades to be that kind of song that people say, oh yeah, I like this, you know, this is getting me going, ready to start the day. And I'm, I'm yeah, I, I really am conscious of that. And also I do a happy headline, Hannah's happy headline, which I feel I've done that for years, which I feel is really important because I do have to read all the news uh, with the breakfast show. And so much of it is, is really depressing. You know, obviously this past year, before that, it was all Brexit for years. And, you know, I think as we know with, with the news, 
whatever's going on in the world, there does tend to be a negative outlook on things. And there's a lot of fear and doom and gloom and things yeah. that we should yeah. be worried about. And, yeah. and it's not me at all. That's not the kind of person I am. So I sometimes struggle reading all this news out because I think I would, I would never, <laughs> I would never read it all myself and share it and talk about it with with my loved ones saying oh we must worry about this there's a there's a new variant that we've all got to be scared about and oh absolutely not so I try and bring a, a light-hearted side to the show definitely well from somebody who listens to you you are Miss Positivity it comes <laughs> across you don't have to try and be positive it's in your voice it's in your soul it comes through and i'm going to before i end i'm going to ask you for one request and that mm. is one of your mornings on your breakfast show i would like you to play a song called the more i see you which was written by uh, a gentleman called harry warren and if you look him up he wrote over 500 songs for film Okay. Uh, in the 30s and 40s, and he was my godfather. And one day, oh, when I leave this earth, um, I have asked my friends to have a party and to just play The More I See You. And that, oh, that's that lovely. Is, that is, well, that's my epitaph, The More I See You. And Hannah Murray, The More I Hear You, The More I'm Not Seeing You. And I just wish you so much happiness for the next 18 years and more, whether it be radio, television, film, stage, who knows where Hannah Murray is going. But in the meantime, I say thank you for being the youngest strong woman that I'm going to be speaking with on the coast. And it's been a joy speaking with you. And to my viewers, I'm going to just say, I will see you again. There will be another strong woman along the coast who you will find out how they got there, what they're doing with their lives, and what are their aspirations. But in the meantime, I say to you, Hannah, thank you and bye-bye. And to my viewers, bye-bye and thank you. Thank you.